Did they, they trade them? them? They were going to trade them. Play them. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. oh, what? He's extubated. He is oh, Chu. He's extubated. You're extubating Chu. Oh, 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 thank oh, you so much for okay, waiting. Oh, oh, that's yeah. all right. Hello, everyone. All right, good. So, uh, so what I was saying is today is an unusual um, neurophysiology lecture because we're going to focus on psychology. Um, um, it's, it's a good illustration of um, how psychologists think, um, it's, and this is not psychiatry either. Um, this is about um, constructs, ideas, and we're going to try to do experiments on something that is very intangible. And then what we're going to do in this talk, though, is we're going to take their concepts and then correlate it with the neuroanatomy and neurophysiology that we've been talking about, including last week's discussion of association cortex. So it's going to be very relevant. So here's the outline. Uh, we're going to talk of one slide worth of brain and mind idea, and then start to get into psychology, anatomy, and physiology. So this is worth just thinking about for a minute. And that when Right now, I'm actually working <clears throat> on the question that I was working on last night is when we say that something causes something else, what does that mean? Okay, well, how, does, how do we decide that A cause, some factor causes a, a, an, a, an, effort, an event? It's a, it's a very peculiar thing uh, since long, uh, even before Aristotle, people have been thinking about that. And, and you come down to the thing that you, well, how do you want to describe it? What system do you want to work with? When you, Think about the brain, um, for instance. Do you want to think about it from the neuroanatomy point of view, or do you want to think about it from neurophysiology point of view, or neuropharm, right? Or do you want to think about mechanisms of disease? Those are all different descriptions, right? And if you were to talk about causation, you would, you would, you could talk about the physiology. Hey, someone, we're just starting. So you'd talk about the physiology of it, or you could talk about the pharmacology of it, or but they all blend together. They're all descriptions of some reality of which we have no real knowledge, right? I keep saying we all live in our, in our own world of perception. And the psychologists have an even more difficult world because we can at least put things under the microscope. They really can't, okay? They can't stick an electrode in so easily, all right? So that's what we're gonna be dealing with. And, um, the question is, how do all these relate to one another? How, when are they separate? When do they overlap? So let's, this is a very important, the, the idea of working memory is a useful and important concept, okay? So some of these slides are a little bit dark, but the, the basic problem was, that up, you know, up until into the 70s, we used the term short-term memory. And if you said to someone, you know, his short-term memory fails or something like that, and you go, well, what do you mean by short-term memory? They had no idea. We had no idea what that meant. And in fact, on starting to, when you, it, it, it didn't mean anything because it meant too many things. And so people started to separate <clears throat> the idea of short-term memory into a much more useful a pair of things. Immediate memory, where they talk about fractions of a second here. This is your neurons are firing and the memory lasts as long as they keep firing. And when they stop, that's over. All right. And then there was this idea of working memory where you sort of, and the question became like, how many balls can you keep in the air? If you're going to decide about something, that's what really what we're talking about when we talk about working memory. You're, you're talking about making decisions. All right. And then long term memory. I think we all get a sense of long term memory. This happened several days ago, or this happened when I was in second grade, and I, I recall that memory. Now, it's worth thinking about decision making for a minute. So let's you do this every day, many times a day, right? A patient comes in, you're looking at the patient, right, in the ED, and they want to know, does this patient need TPA? All right. So we just did this a few minutes ago, right? So what is the my question to you is think and what I want you to do is think about the information that you're holding in your head. And then also you can think about what that means when I say holding in your head. What does that mean? So, so see, so you're, let's, let's stay with this example. So first of all, what do you do? You walk over to the ER doc and you say, what do you know, right? And he tells you what he knows, right? And you go, okay. And then you go, you're looking at the patient, right? 
So you're already picking up things on exam. And then you walk over and you talk to the patient. You get what they know. Or maybe the family member, what they know. You have three different histories floating in here. You have the casual exam. Then you're doing a formal neurologic exam. And you're doing an NI stroke scale. You have three more pieces of information. You walk over and look at the CT scan. You look at the CTA. All right? So you have all that information. Is that enough information to make a decision about whether to give them TPA? Well, what if you didn't know anything about, what if you didn't know that TPA existed? What if you didn't know that there are exclusion criteria for TPA? What if you had no experience on ever giving TPA? So, so no, there's more. There, there are the rules of giving TPA. There's the inclusion exclusion criteria, but you didn't have to get those in the emergency room. You knew those. So you called them forth. You said, I need the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And you're like, what? Okay. And, and by the way, you know, what have I been doing? Well, how does he look compared to other people that I've seen? And you start to bring a world of experience in here. But you remember, that's long-term. You're drawing on long-term memories, right? And then you're making a decision. So you've got, so look at all of the sources and different types of information that are circulating in your head that you're holding in your head. And that's the question is, how are you doing that? And that's what the, the, the psychologists are trying to explain with working memory, okay? And by the way, one more thing, just to make a point, could you give this, could you have done that if you had no language? Could you do this without words? If you didn't know words, if there were no words, could you give TPA? No. So language is, is somehow bound up into all of this. Our thinking really involves a lot of language that's going on in our head. I just, I just want to point these things out, okay? So the term working memory, as I said, this is, this is what I was saying. Short-term memory was a useless term. So these guys named Baddeley and Hitch, introduced what is our current model. They introduced it early, and then in 1986, they revised it again. And these are two really good papers. And if you want to read some interesting stuff, you look up Baddeley and Hitch and read the paper, especially the 1986 paper. It's accessible. It's available. It's a good read. It's, it's a nice paper, OK? And, and remember, you're dealing with psychology. So they're proposing something that nobody has ever seen, OK? And what did they? how did they do it? So they developed an experimental set of tests with which they're going to test and, and, and identify working memory. So one of the tests that they used was this very simple, the six digit span, right? All right. So the question is how many numbers can you remember? Right, all right. And then by the way, what they're doing is interfering. So they're going, well, okay, if I did, let's just sit here. Let's see, I give you some numbers to remember. How do you do? And you, you get it, right? And you do it, and you do it. And then you go, um, okay, I want you to remember these six. Uh, and, and by the way, what do you have for lunch today anyway? Did you, why did you do that? And then you start talking to them while they're trying to remember the numbers. And you find that they don't remember the numbers, okay? So there's an interference, okay? And that's just a simple example. And they're trying to begin to introduce different forms of interference, all right? We'll get to visual in a little bit. So this, right. oh, here's how, now I want you to see the parallels between last week's talk and this week's talk, all right? So they call it a common system. This is, this is psychologists are saying it's a common system that's limited in capacity. It's about infinite. It operates across a range of tasks involving different processing codes and different input modalities. So if you read that, can you begin to just see and you can compare it to last week's discussion of association cortices? So that's how you should be thinking about this. You should be paying attention to their language, but if you want to understand their language, you're a neurologist, okay? Related to the kind of things we were talking about last week, and I will. So different, different input modalities, what does that mean? Well, vision, hearing, smell, touch, okay, I get it. That makes more sense to me than input modalities, but okay, now I know what you mean. Different processing codes. Didn't we say that the visual system starts with some very primitives that come in, lines, moving lines, and pretty soon we're looking at a house. But to get from the lines to the house, 
is not the same thing as getting from the cricket chirp, okay, of the primitives of sound, getting to a violin, right? It's a different processing code. And that's what they're saying. Different inputs, different processing codes. But, the, but working memory operates across a range of all of this stuff. I'm hearing association cortex. I'm hearing uh, inter, you know, inferior parietal lobule, okay? That brings together different modalities which have been processed in different ways to begin to get to a working memory, okay? And it operates within a behavioral context toward a specific goal, amen to that, okay? We are always doing something. You're trying to understand what I'm saying right now, okay? That, that's your job right now. And I'm trying to explain this in a way that is useful. With, this is all happening within a behavioral context. We've made certain assumptions. Right? They make a diagram, okay? This is, this is from the 86 paper, all right? <clears throat> These are the four components of working memory. There is a visuospatial sketch pad. I love the psychologists. They come up with such cute names, okay? So we're doing, gonna deal with a visuospatial sketch pad. We're gonna have a phonologic loop. Okay, with central executive, I get. Okay, where's the central executive going to end up? Lakshmi, where, where's, what's going to be the neuroanatomic equivalent of the central executive component of working memory? Yeah, dorsolateral frontal prefrontal cortex, right? You know it. Okay, I mean, I get it. Okay, and executive episodic buffer. I don't know what that means, and I don't know where that's going to be. Maybe hippocampus. I don't know. Maybe you know medial thalamus. I'm I'm really not sure, but. And I'm not sure, but, but it's gonna have to be someplace, right? That's an assumption that we all make. Yeah, you can say all this, but it has to have an anatomic and physiologic basis, right? Otherwise. Now, here's a drawing from an fMRI of the working memory system. This will look pretty familiar, right? Something like that, right? Okay, so then we're gonna actually have a pretty easy time digesting this. And we can now relax into this and see what the psychologists are saying because they're providing new and important information to us, okay? This is an important way of thinking. So the phonologic loop. So first of all, they begin with the notion that input from auditory system and visual system are different. Now, now let, me, let me have an aside here. I was thinking this morning coming in. They're, we're, they're gonna talk about two systems. And, and my question is, what happened to somatosensory? Where's the somatosensory uh, goo pot? I, you know, I don't know what they're going to call it, right? But they're missing. I know they're missing a piece because I know for certain that the somatosensory system is involved in this. I can reach into my pocket and tell you what I've got in my pocket. So I know it's there. And what about smell? Okay, someone's having sweet and sour right now, right? So, yeah. Well, there's you know, some vinegar floating around the room. Yeah, okay, so, all right, right? So food, okay, so then, so then, okay, the system is gonna be incomplete, but let's still learn from them. So here's, this is true, as if you sing and perform, let me tell you something, this is really apparent to you, that auditory input is transient. When you're done singing, it's gone forever. There's no bringing it back. Okay, so auditory input is transient. The sound comes and goes, it rarely persists. Visual input is different because it, I write it up in there. Look, look at the difference between how long my words lasted from my mouth and, and the page. You can go back and look at it again. You go, what? And look at it again. But if you go, what? I'm, could you say that again? I missed that. No getting it back, is there? So very different. So we're going to have to, so they're saying, we're talking about the, the auditory working memory. This is based on psychology data, okay? Must involve a sustained representation, meaning there's a continuous rehearsal going on. And you go, I'm just going to, I have to remember to, you know, to, okay? Don't, don't forget to, you don't forget, you keep saying it over and over. Don't, you got to do this. You got to do this until you finally reach over and do it, okay? Then it, it <laughs> stops and you don't hear that phonologic loop that's running in your head. So you have a sustained representation, which is a rehearsal that contributes until it contributes to the action perception cycle. And then you can let it go. 
Now, from the psychology point of view, the phonologic loop has two components. There is the phonologic store, they call it, which holds memory traces and fades over a few seconds. The word seconds just sort of dies out. And then there is an articulatory. So you got to be careful here. Articulatory implies speech, right? There is an articulatory rehearsal process analogous to subvocal speech, which retrieves and rearticulates the contents held in order to refresh the memory trace. You have to keep saying it over and over to yourself if you're going to remember it. Until it's stored. And once it's stored, you can bring it back anytime you want. Okay, so they're saying that based on interference with the six digit span test. They're saying, this is how I need, these are the constructs I need to put in place to explain the experiments that I'm doing. So that's why I keep saying, they're doing experiments. They're telling you to remember something and they're interfering with it. And then they go, and I wonder if, if what if I spoke Chinese to him? Would the Chinese interfere with him? Is it just the sound? What if I played music? Would that interfere with it? Um, wh what if I just made a kitchen noises? Okay, not so much. But if I start speaking to him, <laughs> he has a hell of a time remembering the sequence. Okay, so then there must be some language involved in this phonologic loop because only language interferes with it in a certain way, or it interferes with it more than anything else. And they're saying, based on other experiments that they did, that speech enters the phonologic loop directly. So in other words, if I say to you, Anusha, just remember, remember, to, remember to take my uh, uh, USB drive when we're done, okay? Just would you remind me, okay? Anusha, <laughs> that, that enters Anusha's phonologic loop immediately. She, she hears it as words, she's got it as words. She doesn't need to process it, she knows what I want. She has to remember it, but she doesn't need to process it. But, but what, if I, <clears throat> what if I do something like this? I say, I say, listen gang, okay? The next time you hear this, okay, I want you all to raise your right hand, okay? Now what? So let me ask you something. Are you going to, when I do this, what, what, yeah, but, but what, what's going on in your head? Do you just, do you just hear the primitive sound and you go, primitive sound, I raise my hand. When I shake the keys, okay, you know, I say when I do this and you go, well, I'm, I'm not going to remember the sound of his keys, it might change anyway, okay? But when he shakes his keys, then I'm going to have to raise my right hand, okay? So, so then this, Entered the phone. This entered the phonologic loop. Okay, this this sound was recoded into the phonologic loop. Okay, you don't remember. Okay, you remember the shaking keys. Yeah, Annie. I could I I could I could do other things, right? I, I, we could we could put a green square up on the board. I say when you when you see the green square in the upper corner, raise your hand, okay? And then I just program the system to do that. But but you're not only waiting for the green square. You're saying okay, when there's a green square. So it that my point is it's translated into language, and that has obvious limited capacity. We all are limited in our. And this diagram just basically makes this point. Certain things enter the phonologic loop. Okay, directly, and certain things have to be reprogrammed. When we read, we have to take the orthographic, whether it's Chinese characters or hieroglyphics or, or English or whatever it is, we read it, but we remember it phonologically. It's now a formed auditory sound in our head. That's the phonologic loop. And the phonologic output buffer is Broca's area, you know, it's like we eventually get all this together and when we want to, we dump our phonologic output buffer, right? We activate Broca's area, okay? <clears throat> the physiology, and this is a simple-minded physiology, the idea here is that these memories are represented by a group of neurons which are firing, I wouldn't say in synchrony, but they are firing in coordination, okay? 
Yeah, and some coherent or a uh, signal process. Right, it's not synchrony, it's a chronologic sequence. And right. And then there's other memories which we're also dealing with the patient's history, the ED's history, the so with that's a different memory. And we keep those active. And, and the idea is here that you that some of the slower waves of the brain, each one re rehearses these memories and keeps them active. Okay. Or you know, we did this the other day. Um, certain pieces of information, I would say, so we really integrate them. So uh, Zhao Yang was, we were, we were presenting a case and we were going back the next day and, and I said the EF was 35%. And he was surprised that I remembered it, but it wasn't, I wasn't really remembering that his EF was 35%. But what I re was I remembering is that I, at the time that he presented them the day before, I needed to know what his cardiac output was. And he told me it was 35%. And I, no, his EF was 35%. But I didn't really remember the EF. I remembered the guy's physiologic state that happened to include an EF of 35%. That's a different matter. If Zhao Yong said to me, I want you to remember four ejection fractions. Do you mean that you don't you didn't remember it because of what he said? You remembered it because of you had a reason to go look for Yes, I am. Like it was a different community. Confucius, and I quoted Confucius to Zhao Yang, who I just read. Uh, and Confucius said that I don't remember all these things. They're one continuous thread. It's from Confucius? That's Confucius said that. OK, so it's one continuous thread. Yeah, so the philosophers know what they're doing. Now, a little physiology, right? Last year, we talked a great deal about our the auditory system. Uh, area 41 is the receiving, the, the uh, primary receiving area, that's Heschel's gyrus. Primary, typical primary sensory cortex, type five, right? Granular cells, it's sort of, it receives up from the um, medial genicula, it receives what's called the core projection. The core projection is the sound system that we use for recognizing objects, okay? It's not for localization or swatting mosquitoes. We'll, that's, we'll talk about that on the next slide. It's there to recognize the keys, to recognize a trumpet, to recognize a symphony, that sort of thing. And there are two tonotopic, that is frequency modulated uh, representations. We don't know why. And there are like all other areas of the cerebral cortex, they're organized into columns for uh, which, which are functional columns. And there's just a picture of Heschel's gyrus, and you can see that it's tonotopically arranged. Uh, starts here at the uh, uh, apex and goes all the way up, uh, it would be the base of the cochlea. And here it's sitting here, and then it has, like every other, it has the secondary cortex, which is modality specific, and it begins to process it in terms of a variety of things that are very complicated in the sound system. And eventually it reaches to Wernicke's area, where it becomes a concept, okay? And up here, right? This concept will get associated with a word, all right? All right. But the concept is more primitive than the word, but we need the word as well. The non-laminated medial geniculate provides bell. This is, this is for uh, localization and things like that. You know, that. Wernicke's area then we said is for speech. Um, here in areas 41 and 42, the sounds are primitive. As you move into the secondary, they become more complicated and finally so you end up with speech. Now, in the areas for speech and, and, and perception, uh, uh, you have, in Wernicke's area, you have much more complicated neurons. These are combination-sensitive neurons. I love these, all right? Combination-sensitive, which respond to particular combinations of frequencies. I said yet last, last week that I have to be able to tell the difference between a trumpet and a violin, even though they're playing the same note. Okay, same primary pitch, but okay, there are different combinations of sounds which make this a trumpet, or which make this a car screeching, or which make this a nusha, okay, or that sort of thing. <laughs> different other animals, the uh, dolphins and um, uh, bats and that sort of thing, also use these for echolocation. Um, also, there are certain neurons which are discriminate temporal sequence. So it responds, if you remember, we were playing with facial and turning them around and remember the monkey with the brush. And 
So there, similarly to that, there are auditory neurons which pick up a certain sequence. So certainly um, auditory is sequencing because it's transient. You can see the whole visual system all at once. You cannot hear the whole auditory message at once. The, the auditory message is coming in as a sequence. You cannot get it any other way. Okay, you can have a video, which will be a sequence, but you can have a picture, but, but a single sound is not gonna convey a whole lot of information. That needs to come as a sequence, all right? And so there are neurons which you could take the same sequence and find a neuron which responds to this sequence and play the sequence backwards and the neuron won't respond at all. So very, very directional dependent, sort of like time, I just realized that. Sound has to be related to time. I just that's a, a that thought. I, I worry about time all the time. Sound is related to time. I have to think about that. Visual sketch pad. Let's talk about the visual sketch pad. All right. Um, for the visual sketch pad, instead of the six digit span, uh, you have to have a test. You're a psychologist. You need a test. You have to be, inter be able to interfere with the test. All right. This is a good pair of them. So these are the two tests that are used for the visual spatial sketch pad. You have to be careful here now, reading about why they use these tests. So the Corsi block, all right, is a is done these days with a computer most of the time. It's basically a tic-tac-toe board. You can make it more complicated, but it's a tic-tac-toe board. And then the computer goes, you know, upper right, upper right, lower left. And you're supposed to just take your finger and, and tap it and reproduce the sequence that they do. And of course, they, it can get very complicated and they can start moving it around. And they, of course, can also vary the speed with which they do it, all right? And the average person will be able to remember five, a sequence of five is more. Right? Right. Yeah, you can do it all kinds of ways. Um, uh, you can watch the individual, in which case you're probably going to remember it better than if the computer generates it because when you watch the person, you have all kinds of directional information and force and other cues that tell you, but when it's done as a flashing light on a computer screen, all you have is the flashing light on the computer screen, okay? So you have less information and we use that information. I was telling David Grover the other day, I was reading an article on artificial intelligence and robots. And get this, this isn't a robot doing AI, a robot. Okay, when they're trying to teach the robots certain sentences and words, the robot will remember better if they're allowed to do something at the same time with their hand. The robot, the robot needs to use its hand to remember the words that you're trying to teach it. Hello. <laughs> I do that too. We all do it, but a robot? Okay, a okay. robot needs another form of sensory stimulus in order to remember something. A damn robot? Okay, I'm sorry. There's, <laughs> that's telling you something very fundamental about how memory is stored. I mean, really is. Yes. This is the uh, called the visual patterns test. So here's the problem with the um, so the Corsi is the is 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 a there's a problem with visual spatial and that is um, it's limited also by attention span. Okay, so you can just run out of attention. And so it's not only testing visual spatial, uh, okay, not just testing visual. So they have a problem. And it's also very spatially oriented because it's, it's around, it has a sequence that requires attention. And so this test is a different one. This is a visual patterns test where um, they just simply show you different pairs. And because it's already laid out and doesn't vary, there's no sequence involved. There's no spatial orientation involved. And more importantly than I would say anything else in this, but I would also say that's not complete. The reason that this test is in favor is it has no language component. Okay, I don't agree. Okay, I, I don't agree that it doesn't have a language component at all. When I've been looking at this, okay, I name every one of these, okay. I mean, every single one is like it's a, it's a domino, you know, like does six dominoes. Does this describe that some people are better remembering pictures, some people are remembering words better? Mostly what they're going to want to do with this test is interfere with it. <laughs> they want to find out what they can do to prevent you from interfering with your visual spatial sketch path. Because through the perturbation 
of your visual spatial sketch pad is how they're going to define the boundaries and interactions of the visual spatial sketch pad. Yeah, yeah, they'll, 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 they'll put up different cards and you're supposed to remember which card it's paired with or that sort of thing. Okay, so I, I just, I wanna keep focusing on, you know, this is the only time we're gonna talk about psychology. And so you need to learn how psychologists think, okay, from this lecture. It's very interesting. This lecture tells you a lot. Okay, focusing on the visual spatial sketch pad then, see distractions which interfere. Okay, different things interfere with the two different tests. So the two tests are testing different things. They know that, okay? The key is that both systems have a limited capacity. Remember, we, they define working memory as having a limited capacity. This is the basis for that. It's not infinite, you can't, okay? Color, shape, and orientation seem to be stored differently. You interfere with them at different, the Stroop test, Right, you know what the Stroop test is, everybody. You okay? You here? You put up the word red, but it's colored green. You know, sure. <laughs> you know, they're they're playing with your mind. Yes, they are. Okay, it's, they're they're trying to find what they can interfere with. It, okay, working memory appears related to perception. Yeah, spatial is more to attention and action. So then they're saying, hmm, there seem to be two different visual systems, and this is where you have to give these guys a lot of credit. And they're looking at the visual systems and they're going, I don't know, I can't, I can't do this as a single visual system. I got different things interfering in different ways depending on the test that I'm doing. It seems to me that there are two different visual systems. One visual system seems to have to do with attention, spatial orientation, and actions. There's, and then there's another visual system which you know, involves colors and shapes and seems to be more about object identification. And you go, good show. Good show, guys. Okay. And we deal with this. Okay. This is there's a strong physiology which they have anticipated. Okay. All right. So they've done a good job. And they, of course, use terms like dorsal streams. We would just call it the dorsal pathway or the ventral you know, system. But here you have, and again, from last year's talks, we have um, that you have the magnocellular neurons in the ganglion cell layer, and they project to the magnocellular layer of the lateral geniculate, and they project to layer 4C alpha, and then to 4B, and then they go into the B5, the visual area 5. This is up in the parietal area for motor. Motor and mosquito. And then you have a second pathway known as, they call it the ventral stream, but this is a totally different neuronal system with parvocellular ganglion cells, a parvocellular layer of the lateral geniculate different from the other. It goes to a different layer of four, you know, and then it doesn't even go to other areas of four. It goes to layers two and three, which means it's gonna be going and sharing that information with other areas of cortex, because that's what two and three do. All right, and then these terminate in different visual areas. All right, so same sort of thing, visual system, cortical columns, one system going for form, one system going for motion. They, of course, interact. They come up to different cell layers. <coughs> All right, they project to different regions. All right, two different systems. So, so again, I say you got to give the psychologist some credit here that based on just interference with tests, not seeing anything, they come up with this, it's pretty good, really. And this is known as the dorsal stream and the ventral stream. And this is going to these, this is all coming out of area 17, 18, 19, visual one, two, and three, 17, 18, and 19, and now projecting into <coughs> heteromodal association cortices. Let's go back to last week's terminology, heteromodal, that is, <clears throat> These are going up and sharing with somatosensory, all right, for motion, swat the damn mosquito. These are going down to auditory system so that we can now begin to name these things and get some ideas of concepts so that we can then store them as memories that are a lot easier than remembering primitive sounds. I mean, it all fits together. <clears throat> now, so we've got a new concept and that is it's gonna, this is gonna be a lot harder because we don't really have a simple anatomy for this one. All right, so episodic buffer. Now the question is, why did the, this is what they added in 1986. This did not exist 
in the original model. All right, so let's let's look at this. So they bring this in because they need a separate storage system, which is a limited capacity and which is multimodal. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. So that's what's different is that they're going, well, sometimes these things, you know what? Sometimes these things don't even seem to care what the modality was. Well, now this does sound familiar to us, okay? That episodic refers to holding information that is integrated from a range of systems, including other working, working memory components and long-term memory into a coherent complex structure of a scene or an episode. And they call it a buffer because it's an intermediary between these systems. So it goes from these primitives, heteromodal systems, okay, into some unitary idea, which by the way, we're gonna act on. And it was needed, okay, from the psychology point of view, because look at the simple piece of data that they had that led them to postulate this. They said, when we give five, when we give unrelated words, all they can do is remember five words. But if we stay in the same topic, they do 16 words. Well, there was nothing in the phonologic loop that would allow you to, to explain that. There was nothing about the phonologic loop that would satisfy that. And so they said, and then they were bothered by the fact that they realized that the phonologic loop and the visual sketchpad kept interacting with one another. And they were going, well, how does that happen? We need a new piece. All right, and so they proposed an episodic buffer was what they called it, all right? And then these were tests that merged them and then they said, this is, this is getting crazy. When you go to the physiology, all right, first of all, what you find is that you're dealing with association cortex and it can come from the same hemisphere or from different hemispheres. It can come from secondary, you know, heteromodal areas. It can come from the premotor cortex and, and it interacts with all the, lower subsystems as well. I just put this diagram in because it was familiar from last week. From the psych psychology, oh, so we're moving to the central executive, all right. I would say, and I should have put a slide in if I, if I didn't, when I hear myself now, I would put that salmon colored slide and I would point you to the inferior parietal lobule. And I would say, really, that's gonna be the anatomic substrate of the episodic buffer heteromodal, everything coming in, all right. Central executive, this is the last piece of this system, right? And, and central executive, all right, here. So this is what I would have pointed to as the neuroanatomic equivalent of the episodic buffer. And again, I think you have to give these guys credit when they get from the point that they they, they're wondering why you remember 16 related, but only five unrelated words. And they propose that all of these systems have to come together to interact with one another. It's like, okay, you know, pretty good. Central executive. So they, they, this is the current state of affairs. It is the most important, but the least understood. The, the initial ideas were, were, were actually regional, regionally long gone. Now, here's when I read this this morning, and it said, how does it interact with the two slave system, meaning the visual, the visual sketch pad and the phonologic loop. And I thought, you're missing several pieces here. You're missing somatosensory. You're missing olfactory. You're missing interoceptive, okay? All right, so there are a lot of pieces. They've, they've got a lot of work to do before this model is fully uh, played out. And if I were to interact, if my brother were still active, I would tell him to go back and repeat these experiments digit span and that sort of thing with objects in the hand. Uh, that's what I would do. I would, if I were a psychologist, I would go do that right now. All right, and, and it needs to address two different types of human actions, which I was thinking of Zhao Yang. So if you, if, when I'm walking with Zhao Yang, okay, and we're talking about a patient, all right, and he's focused on a patient, all right, we, and we approach a door, we're, we're, we're both moving, right, and we get to the doorway, and Zhao Yang opens the door, right? And we both go through. Is Zhao Yang thinking about opening the door? Not really. <laughs> Zhao Yang's <laughs> thinking about the patient, okay? When you come in here, if you're talking to someone, okay? And you have to put the 1369 in, do you think about the 1369? Do you stop, do you interrupt your conversation? 
Well, some people do. We say they can't walk and talk at the same time. Some people do, right? Okay. A lot of people do. They can't chew gum and walk at the same time, right? There, there are people like that. But then a lot of other people, they, they, they don't even know. And you say, um, what was that code? And they go, what? So I'll give you an example. My brother and I are both the same way. We both, he plays guitar and sings. I play banjo and sing, right? We can both finish the song and someone will say, that was a sad song. And we go, and we can't even remember the words. We haven't heard the words. I, I couldn't tell you what the words were, okay? I didn't hear the words. I wasn't, I was singing, you know? I was making phonologic sounds and, 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 but I, I might not know at all what the song is about. And he said, yeah, I'm in the same way. We both did the same thing. So there are certain things that are routine that you do, and you, and you really don't have to think about them. Frontal lobe gets involved, it doesn't, it deals with them. And, you, and then there's other stuff that's very complicated. Should we give this guy TPA? This is a very complicated decision. And we all have to think about this a lot. And we make use of all of the information that is available to us. And <laughs> I love this comment. And the limited capacity reemerges. <laughs> You've run out of abilities sooner or later. It's in your fingers, right? Exactly. It's in your fingers, right? And 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 you don't have to. You just like it's just it's there. It's it's. You, yeah, a pantry number. Yeah, exactly. You remember the pantry as a visual spatial sequence, not as a series of numbers. It's like, okay, how often? Everybody knows this. This is this is common. You you say, um, did uh, could you? You're reading a book. I mean, a book. Okay, not not a not a not your iPad. You're reading a book. Okay, and and someone says, um, and someone asks you a question about the book. You know what 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 what's the dosage of that? And you go, oh. Um, you know what, it's in the upper right corner of the right page. And you just start leafing through the book. You don't even know what chapter yeah. you're in, but you know it's in the, it's about two thirds of the way through the book in the upper right <laughs> corner, right? And you, you know it's there. That's what we're talking about. <clears throat> All right. The, in the central executive, okay, so the, the important thing about the primary data that the psychologists use is the ability to switch attention. And that's a problem. They talk about Alzheimer's. Believe me, there are a lot of people who have difficult. In many ways, this is the hardest thing in the world to do is to switch your attention and your mindset from one thing to another, which also when you talk about multitasking, it's interesting to think about this. Are you really doing two things at once or are you switching back and forth very quickly between two things? So, so your ability to do that is, is involved in this central executive idea. Now, this is what I really like that they introduce the concept of salience by which they mean the same idea of val value, valence, which we were talking about last week. And remember we said the IPL really doesn't care what the modality was. The only question is, am I interested, right? That's really the question. And that's why, okay, yeah, novel stimuli will always get your attention. Okay, that's basic physiology. And so these areas, the central executive is dealing with novel. It's, and making a decision, by the way, is always novel. I've never had to quite make this decision before. I have to, I understand, I have to decide about giving TPA. I've made the decision about TPA before, but I've never seen a patient quite like this one before. And I never have, okay? So that be, makes it novel. All right. And now, now the psychologists are, and they're way behind on this. They're getting, behind, you know, oh, oh goodness, it's involved in manipulation of data. Yeah, hello. Everything from the entire brain is feeding into that. No kidding. Okay. It's closely allied with attention and focus, and it interacts heavily with all other components of working memory. And we say from the psychology point of view, we draw pictures like this from the, from, from the physiology point of view and neuroanatomic point of view, we say, yeah, no kidding. We've got all of these connections coming from all of the heteromodal and transmodal areas that are feeding into dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And at any rate, we're gonna, as you know, we're gonna talk about go, no go neurons and stuff like that. So we're gonna be at a pretty high level and they're still working out the, how this system is plugged in, okay? So, and, it, and this is just getting harder for them, you know? I mean, it just gets harder now. 
it's it's one thing to interfere with digit span. It's another thing to to understand you know, decision-making, <laughs> you know, this is, this is gonna, this definitely we're getting into harder stuff. So now you want to interfere, what interferes with decision-making? When do you make a good decision or a bad decision? It's almost like studying how doctors make decisions, right? All right, dorsolateral cortex, we talked about it last week. It's a prototypical type three. This is where you make the decisions. All of this stuff comes together. We did, we showed this nice drawing from last year. Um, we we already been through this. They project to supplementary motor. They project down to basal ganglia. They project to the premotor area. They project to the cerebellum. So everybody knows what to do for smooth, coordinated motion. Even if that motion is no more to say, okay, I just wanted to show you I could stand up and talk at the same time. Okay, and you know, but but all of that, all of my basal ganglia, cerebellum, they all have to know what I plan to do in order to do that properly. All right, and then we talked last week uh, about the go-no-go -no -go neurons and that sort of thing. And, and I put up this picture of go-no-go -no -go neurons. These are the different physiology, because this is a physiology lecture. And so I was talking about, you know, these are neurons that are sitting there and, and you say, okay, if you get two things in a row, so here's what I think. So, right, I don't, I don't know what, uh, Okay, if, if, if we see, all right, here, here's a good example from this morning. So if we see a spike, okay, and this guy's have EEG, and, it's, it's, it's only, and we only see one spike at a time, we're gonna keep tapering as we're said. But if we see him couple a bunch of spikes or build a spike wave out of this, out of this single spike, and it continues, then we're going to up his verse. Right. Okay. So then we see the spike, and we're, you know, we're waiting to see if what happens next. All right. And depending on if the cue appears, then we take one action. And if the cue doesn't appear, then we don't take the action. Okay. All right. So we're just about done. This is a drawing that I made for myself many years ago when I was trying to understand this whole thing, and I still like it. It, it was it was a useful drawing. So I, I thought in terms of an action perception axis. Remember, I believe that fundamentally the two are, are one, that all of our perception is active, okay? That all of our actions require perception, okay? You have to have it. You, every single thing that we do is on this axis. And the question was, what were the, so because I believe that we don't, have any direct knowledge of the world around us, but all we have are the representations that we create of the world around us. I created in my drawing for myself a representational plane. That's what I call it, is the representational plane. And I, my representational plane includes my understanding through language, my emotions, okay, the representations of my emotion, my appetites, the incoming sensory information of the world in front of me. And all of these things come together to influence my action perceptual access until I, in the end, take some action or don't. I'm surprised you said appetite. Appetite matters. I'm hungry right now. And so I'm going to end this lecture soon because I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Let me No, I well, you might have, but I bet. But that's lectures, one thing we can change, I, right? It's it's person by person. It's not absolutely. We're no well, no wait. <laughs> all of us. What I would say is, all of us live on this, but for some of us, emotion is more important than language, or language is more important. There are people who act without thinking, right? There are people who you know don't you do this, or you're led by your head, or you're led by your head, or led by your heart. Right when you fold your hands over which thumb is on top, right? Things like that. We're you're all going to be with your head because you're neurologists for the minute. So uh, you know it's I mean, but different different things and different times. Of course, there are going to be times when I'm I'm exhausted, and I, you know what? I eat more when I'm exhausted. I'm just too tired to keep the diet under control. I'm going to go get some Chinese food. Okay, I mean you know it's just like feel like pigging out. Right? I don't. I don't want to exert self-restraint. I'm not in the mood for that right now. Okay, I'm just gonna eat what I feel like.
I mean, you know, so I change from moment to moment. The, did I go over the analogy? I just, to finish on this, um, I, I wanted to, by the way, this is, this is what our friend has to say today. <laughs> He's working in a context right now. <clears throat> so the, did I go over the analogy of the Stony Brook students going up to the ski lodge? All right. So here, this is really useful. I, I find this, and, and when, when I, normally when I lecture on decision-making, I start with this. So there are, there are five medical students from Stony Brook who are going skiing on a Saturday morning. They're in the car and they're driving up the New York Thruway. Everything's going along fine. And then a sign comes up and it says, rest stop, two miles, right? So the driver says, you want me to pull over or should we keep going? All right, <laughs> right? Now, think about the influences that go on in the car. So of course the first order of business is, does anybody need to pay? Because yeah. if anybody needs to pay, we're pulling over, okay? Yeah. And that's that. But then there are lots of other things. Are you hungry, thirsty? Yeah. What about lesser things that you might have? I always say, and are you sitting next to someone that you can't stand? Or there's someone else in the car that you'd like to be sitting next to? <laughs> Right, so you know all these things matter, right? I, you just need to get up and stretch. Are you early? When does the ski place open? Are we early or are we late? What's the conditions? All right, what's the weather forecast? It's, you know, we don't want to be. It's going to be really cold in the morning, and then it warms up nice. About you know, so all those things matter. But so so the driver's going. Come on, guys. I mean, I'm you know I'm not in the car here. So so what does he do? Okay, he pulls over into the right lane, right? And he's going, one mile ago, are we, you know? So here's the point, okay? In the end, when all of these things have been considered, you either pull off or you keep going. It's a binary decision. You do it or you don't, okay? And that's just a great analogy for how the brain makes its decisions. And all of the things got in, included in the, in the discussion. Everything's there, right? So that's it. Okay, that's, that's working memory. It's a great concept, it really is. And I always say, just think about your inferior parietal lobules and your dorsolateral uh, prefrontal cortex and the two of them interacting together. That's the anatomic substrate of working memory. And the working memory is a good explanation for how these two systems interact. Okay, <clears throat> that's it. Thank you. Yeah, fun and games, I love it. I'm not sure it's still there.